UI Toolkit is now the recommended way to create editor scripts for things like custom inspectors in Unity. As of Unity version 2022.2, I believe, Unity actually switched from IM GUI and now all their default inspectors are drawn using UI Toolkit, which you can see is being confirmed with our UI debugger here. This video is for you if you don't know much or anything about editor scripting and you want to get your feet wet and learn a little bit using the newer, easier editor scripting methods that UI Toolkit gives you. What we're going to create from scratch is a custom inspector for this script here. I will show you how to style it very easily so that you can organize your data better. I'll show you how to make use of rich text, how to add and assign functions to buttons, and how to hide certain objects based on the value of a bool variable. Ready? Let's go. So I have this little player attack stats script, and you can see there's really nothing to it, it just holds some data. So to get started, we first need to create an editor script, and it needs to be inside a folder called editor, otherwise you're going to get errors when you try to build your game. The editor folder does not need to be in the root, it can be anywhere in your project. So I'm going to create a player attack stats editor, and open it up. Now right off the bat, there are three namespaces we're going to need to add. Unity editor. Unity editor .ui elements and Unity Engine.ui elements. And we're not inheriting from mono behavior. We want to inherit from editor as this is an editor script. And now we need to connect this editor script to our player attack stats script, because this editor script is going to tell Unity's UI how to draw the inspector basically. So we can add a custom editor attribute type of player attack stats up here. Perfect. Now we need to call the method that actually draws the inspector. If you type override, we're looking for the create inspector GUI function. You'll notice right now if we save, nothing has changed. It looks exactly like it did. This base here is essentially doing the default drawing for us, but we don't want to do that, so let's get rid of it. And now to show you that this is working, you'll notice that this method needs to return a visual element. So let's create a new one called root and return it. Okay, now it doesn't show anything, which is perfect because now we can build it from the ground up like we want. And you can do this completely with code if you want, which would be very similar to the old IM GUI way. However, I want to show you how to do it in the UI builder instead. So in my UXML folder here, I'm going to create UI toolkit, UI document, and I'll call it player attack stats visual tree. Okay, now back in our editor script, let's set up a public variable of type visual tree asset. And in our method here, we're going to call visual tree dot clone tree and pass in the root. What this is essentially going to do is add everything that we build in UI builder to our root visual element here so that it actually gets drawn. And let me show you what I mean. Real quick, let's open up our UXML file. And I'm not going to explain the UI builder in this tutorial. If you've never been in here before and you want to get familiarized with how it works and how to use style sheets and all of that good stuff, then you can check out this tutorial I posted last week, which goes through all of that in detail. Now to open up more options for editor scripting, we can select the root and check the editor extension authoring here. That's going to open up some editor only controls down here. Now for testing, I'm just going to go ahead and toss in a label real quick and save. Now, in order to actually connect our UXML or our Visual Tree Asset file to our editor script, just select our editor script and assign the Visual Tree up here. Now, if we go back to our player attack stats, we will see our label in there. Now, to make this even more user friendly, let's click up here and turn on UI Toolkit Live Reload. Just remember to turn this off when you are done with your script building, because apparently this is fairly expensive and it could just slow down the engine for you a little bit. But now what it's going to do is if we add stuff in here, it's going to update right away whether we have saved or not. All right, let's actually set up some proper stuff. I'm going to drag in three different visual elements to act as containers. I'm going to call these pane one, pane two, and pane three. Now in pane one, I want to show these two variables from our actual script. So in order to add those in, to stay organized, I'm going to add in another container or visual element and call it vars. And inside there, we're going to add two property fields. Now we want to connect these property fields with our actual variables. So in order to actually connect them, we need to type the name of the variable into our binding path here.
And I'm assuming this doesn't get redrawn when we bind something to it. That's why it's not updating automatically. But if I select something else and then select this script again, it's going to trigger a redraw of the inspector. And now you can actually see our variables again. All right, so we're getting somewhere. Now I'd like to add a nice big header above these. So I'm going to drag in a label. Also, if you want this to match the style of your inspector over here, select this and choose Active Editor Theme. Okay, so we're going to make this say Movement. I'm going to make it bold and size 24. And actually, let's add a black outline to it, because why not? And increase the letter spacing. Anyways, you get it. It's very, very easy to style things, okay? So let's add some buttons now. I'm going to add a button container here and then drag in two buttons into there. Now for these, I'm gonna add a style sheet so that we can change them both very easily. I'm gonna create a new player attack editor style and then create a new dot button selector. And I'll apply that selector to both of our buttons. And you can confirm that's been done by highlighting over the selector here. I'm gonna change the height to 40%. Make sure the text wraps. I'll add some margins and some padding. And let's make them a little bit round as well. Now I gave more info about pseudo classes in my last UI toolkit video. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, go ahead and go back and watch that. But you can use pseudo classes to make use of our transition animations here as well, even for editor scripts. I'll add a dot button hover here. And in the hover pseudo class, I'll scale up the buttons. And then back here in just.button, I'll add a slight duration. And now just like in-game UI, we can animate our UI in the inspector. Now this would look a whole lot better if we had one section on the left and one section on the right. So let's see how we can do that. I'm going to create a dot section selector here and apply that to our vars and buttons containers. And on that selector, I'm going to add some margin and some padding. Let's give it a nice background color. And for this, instead of manually just selecting a color, let's right click over here and let's set variable instead. We're gonna search for default background and choose this one. What's really great about choosing a variable like this is that the color changes with our editor skin. So even if we change this to light theme, we're still gonna have that slightly darker background, but it's more appropriate for that theme. And let's go ahead and slightly round the borders a bit here too. And finally, to get this into two sections, go up to our pane one here and change its flex direction to rows. And I'll change the vars container to take up 60% of the width. And the buttons can be 40%. All right, there we go. Also, if you're enjoying the video, then thank you if you leave a like or a comment. Now let's actually get those buttons doing something. Let's make this one say randomize move speed and we'll call it that as well. And let's call this second one set to default values and we'll call it default values. I'm going to set up the functions for those buttons here in our actual player attack stats script. This one is going to select a random number between 0 and 100 and apply it to our move speed. And this one is going to set our move and dash speed right back to their default values. So to actually call those, we're going to go back to our editor script. So first, let's set up some variables for our buttons. And to actually get them, we can do a query from the root and use a string to find the name that we assigned the button. Next, we're going to want a reference to our player attack stats. So here's a variable for that. We say that this is equal to the target and then cast the script as the type. The target is set once we use this attribute up here. Now, as for the first button, let's register a callback, which is an event that's gonna be fired when we click the mouse. So let's use click event. And for the callback, let's call this function down here, which just calls the function we set up in our attack stats script. And same thing for the other button, we're going to register a callback and call whatever function we want to call when that event is fired. Mm -hmm. 
now you can see the numbers are actually changing when we click on those buttons. For pane two, I just wanna show you how rich text works. So I'm literally just gonna throw a label in there. This is really just about opening and closing using the right tags. It's very, very simple. I'll make this one bold and change its color to red. And this one over here, I'll add a hyperlink to it. These are very easy to use. I'll leave a description down below for all the supported rich text tags for UI Toolkit. And to make this section match, let's actually add the section selector to our label. And for pane three, let's add a container with the dot section selector. And inside there, first I'm going to add a property field for our bool. So let's set the binding path and we'll call it toggle bool. And then we'll add a visual element that's gonna hold everything that we want to hide. So let's call this all elements to hide. Now for the floats, we're gonna go ahead and add property fields with their bindings. And for the enum, we'll add an enum and also set its binding path. Now, in order to hide stuff based on a bool, we need to register a change event callback on our toggle bool here. So first, let's set a variable for our property field. And we'll find that in the same way as the buttons, we'll query, pass in the type and search by string. Let's set up the callback function first. We'll call this on bool changed method. And it will call this check for display type function, which we'll fill out in just a second. When we register a change event of type bool on our toggle here. So we still need two more references. We need our all items to hide visual element. So let's grab that real quick because this is the one where we're gonna change its visibility based on the value of the bool. And in order to actually check the value of the bool, we need to set up a serialized property variable. And we can find that by using serialized object dot find property and search by string. The reason we need to do that is so that we can actually go down here and create our if statement and say, if our toggle objects property dot bool value is true, then we'll show it. Otherwise we'll hide it. To show or hide, we want to toggle between this flex or none option here. We can do that by saying all items to hide dot style dot display is equal to display style dot flex to show it and display style dot none to hide it. And actually we wanna call this here as well so that whenever the inspector is drawn, it also does a check that's either gonna hide or show our variables as well. And there you go, you can see that's working as well. Now there's one more really important thing to note it's really easy to add stuff for organization. And for example, let's just put all of this stuff into a foldout group here. And if we make these child classes of that foldout, it's just gonna work, right? But you'll notice that if we select another game object and then go back, it doesn't seem to remember our last setting. It was closed and now it's open, which is annoying and makes this basically useless. This is not happening with our other values because they all have binds on them. They are bound to variables in another script, so it reads from there. But this foldout right now, it doesn't hold or have any data attached to it. So whenever we click our player, it just draws the inspector and chooses whatever the default is, which I guess is open. So if you want it to remember the position it was in last, but it's not bound to any variable anywhere, all you have to do is give the view data key a name. That's gonna create a data key which will store its state. So now you can see it actually remembers. This works the same for basically anything that's unbound, bools, even scroll lists. If you wanted it to remember the scroll position you were at last, this would work for that as well. So as of right now, there's not a lot of really great documentation on editor scripting with UI Toolkit yet. 
Unity is continuing to improve UI Toolkit. They have a long roadmap and they really want this system to be good because the UI Toolkit system is meant to be eventually completely replacing the old UI system for in-game UI as well as replace the old IM GUI system for editor scripting as well. So changes are coming, improvements are coming, but it's now finally, especially for editor scripting, in a really good state where it's a lot less painful to make editor scripts than before. That's all I got for you guys. See you in the next one.